Hi again. Welcome to another video about the effects of drugs and alcohol on the body and the brain. This is designed for my classes in drug and alcohol counseling or psychology. In this session, we're going to cover the material on the nervous system and how drugs and alcohol might affect it. As a little background on this topic, and to show you how our knowledge has changed, I first studied the physiological psychology back in 1967. At that point, there were two neurotransmitters in our uh, textbook to study and a lot of structures in the brain. When I returned in the late 1990s to take classes in drug and alcohol counseling, the textbook listed over 200 neurotransmitters and said there were probably 200 more that had not yet been identified, named, or uh, we didn't understand what they were doing. The field has continued to grow, and as it grows, we learn more and more. It's important for drug and alcohol counselors to understand the basics of this topic. I'll try to present it without oversimplifying it so much that I'm misleading you. But the way in which drugs and alcohol affect the brain and the nervous system tells us a lot about the problems involved in addiction and in recovery from addiction. When we talk about psychological experiences, it's important to note that all feelings and emotions, much of our behavior, all uh, psychological experiences are based on brain activity. And for this discussion, it's important to note that brain activity, half of your brain or nervous system, is not in your head. Throughout your body, there are nerve cells. There are nerve cells that wrap around your stomach and your intestine. So when we say that someone makes us sick to our stomach, we actually have nerve cells there that constrict and cause that discomfort. When you say someone is a pain in the neck, if you reach up and touch those muscles in your neck, you will find they have tightened up. So we will look at how emotions and the body and the brain interact. The way that drugs affect the nervous system tells us a lot about addiction. Drugs affect nerve cells in some very special ways. Drugs in the brain and by extension the nervous system. First, a little about the brain and how the nervous system works. Our knowledge of the brain continues to expand. The brain is made up of specialized cells called neurons. Neurons are able to communicate with each other, and they also can communicate with muscles and other parts of the body. Then, we'll need to talk about how psychoactive drugs affect the brain. One of the things that psychoactive drugs have to do is cross the blood-brain barrier. We have, as humans and other animals too, a membrane which separates the brain from other parts of the body. And so the blood, which nourishes the nerve cells and, and other cells in the brain, has to go through that blood-brain barrier. Some drugs readily pass through it and do a great deal. Other drugs don't go through it and or go through it only to a small extent and have very little impact on our thinking, feeling, and behaving. Once those drugs cross that blood-brain barrier or reach a nerve cell outside the brain, then those drugs act on those neurons in some very special ways. Let's look at the structure of the nerve cell, the neuron, which is a specialized communicator cell. It's important to notice this is a very generic kind of description. When I first studied it, we didn't even know that there were those little hair-like dendrites at the ends of the cell. We just saw body and, and the long uh, cell nucleus. But we now know there are a lot of varieties of nerve cells. Some people spend their entire career studying one specific type of neuron. The neuron will have dendrites kind of like the wig on the, on the head of the cell, has a cell body, 
The axon is the long thing structure that you see that looks like a string of beads. And again, we didn't know back in the 1960s and 70s that those little structures had gaps between them and some chemicals could move in and out of the cell through those openings. That long part is called the axon. There's a thing called myelin, which is a, like an insulation, similar in nature to the way your hand grows fingernails, which are hard and protective. So the brain, in general terms, has three types of cells. Black cells, which have no insulation on them, on their uh, axon. Gray cells, which have small layers of insulation, and the white matter, which has heavy layers of insulation. At the end of the cell are the axon terminals. Those terminals uh, contain little uh, envelopes uh, which contain chemicals. It's important to note that our wiring in our brain isn't like electrical wiring in your house where you have to plug something into a wall socket to make a physical connection. There are gaps between nerve cells called synapses or synaptic gaps. Those gaps turn out to be especially important when we learn about how drugs and alcohol can alter the way in which a thought in the brain moves from one nerve cell to another. So the myelin acts as insulation, and it builds up gradually. The more myelinated, the more insulated a cell is, the faster the signal can move down it. One of the basic ideas is that the axon transmits information from one end to the other electrically. This is why in the early days of psychology, we would study the brain by inserting electrodes, put a shock into a structure, and see the leg of a rat move, and assume that that structure, in fact, controlled the movement of the leg. We've since learned that as that electricity flows down the nerve cell, it also sets off chemical reactions, sometimes called a second messenger system. For our purposes in studying drugs and alcohol and their effects on the brain, we won't go that detailed. But what we do need to know is that the ability of the cell to uh, accumulate an electrical charge and then to discharge it is called an action potential. Cells that are drained of the electrical charge won't work correctly. This electricity is created as a result of the flow of ions within the nerve cell. This brings up the question, what is an ion? If you've ever put salt into water and watched it disappear, you've done a simple experiment on looking at ions and how they disassociate in liquid. Some elements have positive charges and some have negative charges. Ions are either negatively or positively charged. Salt, and there are many kinds of salt beyond just the simple table salt most people are familiar with, but table salt is made up of sodium and chloride. So the positive ions in sodium are larger than the negative ions in chloride. This allows the two to be separated in liquid, which is one of the reasons that when we put salt in water, that wa resulting water can conduct an electrical charge. It's important to understand transmission of signals within a cell and from one cell to another. As we said before, most neurons do not touch, although some of them over time grow closer and closer together or even wrap around each other. One idea is that the more you think of thought, the closer those two nerve cells get together and the faster that signal occurs. So that thought is more likely to reoccur. The gap I've mentioned is called a synapse or synaptic gap. So how does the signal get across the gap through the blood? Well, neurons end at the terminals. The terminals contain buttons or vesicles. The vesicles contain chemicals that will carry the message from one cell to another. 
This picture gives a very detailed look at the nerve cell, and as you see, the more closely we look at a nerve cell, the more complicated it turns out to be. But one important thing to look at is that little round inset at the top, which shows how the vesicles up there uh, occur and how there are chemicals in them and how when electrical current comes down the nerve cell, it causes the, those vesicles to open and to throw those chemicals out into the space between nerve cells. Chemical transmission occurs when a signal moves from one nerve cell to another nerve cell that is close by. The dendrites have or grow receptor sites. When I first studied this, we thought of those receptor sites as physical structures. But what we've learned over the years is that in fact they are molecules that can float free on the outside of the nerve cell. So it's possible that we have uh, can grow more nerve cells called upregulation or that if a chemical is not used very often, the nerve cells stop producing receptors for that and downregulate. Uh, each receptor is a different shape and it's designed to fit a particular neurotransmitter shape. This means that, uh, and it's a very important phenomenon that a particular chemical when it moves across the gap into the next nerve cell carries a specific symptom or a signal. Drugs of abuse are shaped just like naturally occurring neurotransmitters. This is how they are able to get into the brain, go between cells, and send a message that might never have existed uh, before the drug of abuse was introduced. So to summarize, there are two ways that a signal is transmitted in the nervous system. Within a neuron, it is moved electrically, but between nerve cells, messages are moved chemically. Both uh, are recycled in a well-regulated brain, but there are times that these chemicals, both electrical uh, and uh, neurotransmitters don't get recycled and we'll see that that is part of the reason that drugs can cause damage to the brain. The receptors sit on the dendrites. The neurotransmitters have shapes and so do the receptors. This is sometimes called the lock and key theory. The key has to fit the lock in order for the chemical to produce the desired or undesired result. When I do this uh, lecture in class, I do an in-class demonstration in which I show various uh, neurotransmitters, how they're shaped differently, how they move across to the next cell, and then go into the lock. For simplified uh, purposes here, let's say that stimulants are all shaped like triangles. That's a gross oversimplification. They're much, much more complicated, like the keys that you might have for locks uh, to a door. But naturally occurring in the brain would be a stimulant chemical. For example, if somebody fires a gun at you, your body will kick out a large amount of adrenaline. Uh, in, when it's in the uh, nervous system, adrenaline is called norepinephrine. It's another name for nervous system adrenaline. And that triggers all kinds of things to happen in your nervous system and your body. Well, other stimulant drugs, such as cocaine or methamphetamine, are shaped in a very similar way to naturally occurring adrenaline. So if they're, in this example, triangular, they could be uh, a longer, thinner, wider triangle, but if they fit into the receptor, they do just the same thing that the adrenaline would have done. So for each of the major kinds of neurotransmitters, it appears there are likely to be drugs of use and abuse that would fit into those systems and make them work the way, same way that naturally occurring neurotransmitters would work. Now some general information about neurotransmitters.
At the end of each nerve cell are vesicles, storage places that contain chemicals called neurotransmitters. At the end of a given nerve cell, there may be multiple vesicles containing various kinds of neurotransmitters. There are chemicals called agonists, which are things that will fit into the site of a particular neurotransmitter. So they do the same thing. For example, stimulant drugs fit into the site that is present for uh, adrenaline or norepinephrine. An antagonist is a chemical which blocks the site from working. As these neurotransmitters are released they <laughs> and used, they, something needs to happen to them. And one of the things that can happen is reuptake. There are enzymes produced in the brain which break down neurotransmitters after they've been used, and then the parts of those neurotransmitters can be reabsorbed into a nerve cell, recycled, and made into more neurotransmitters. Enzymes are breaking down these neurotransmitters. It's important to talk about the blood-brain barrier. If you think of this as you eat some bad food, and that big chunky stuff's floating around in your bloodstream and it makes you sick to your stomach and vomit, you don't want all that decaying material getting into your brain. Well, the blood-brain barrier is designed to keep things out of the brain that should not be there. An interesting phenomena is that when people drink alcohol, the blood-brain barrier begins to leak and all the blood sugar in the brain begins to leak out, resulting in a loss of glucose. There are hundreds of different kinds of neurotransmitters, more being discovered as we go along. And each one of those neurotransmitters has subtypes. For example, we, many people are familiar with the neurotransmitter serotonin, which has been connected with a shortage of it or low levels of it with depression. But to use an analogy, saying serotonin is like saying Ford car. Well, it makes a lot of difference if we're talking about a Fiesta or an Escort or we're talking about a pickup truck. There are multiple types of serotonin, each slightly different in shape and or uh, length and so on. Another thing we need to think about before we're done is neurogenesis, and that is how do or do nerve cells grow. Also, what happens if a nerve cell becomes depolarized? That is, the electrical potential is drained from it. One thing that seems to happen with long-term alcohol use is that some nerve cells lose their polarity and they can't produce an electrical potential. If the person stops drinking and stays not drinking for a long time, then that nerve cell tends to repolarize though not every nerve cell might. Lastly, a new chemical has been discovered in the brain called delta Phos B. If you want to find information, if you look on uh, many of the websites now, you'll find information on this and other delta Phos chemicals. It seems that when someone uses a particular drug or behavior, levels of this drug build up in the brain. And at some point, a switch flips and it becomes normal for that part of the brain, that nerve cell, to need that drug in order to function. So what happens to leftover neurotransmitters? Well, enzymes can break them down. Uh, reuptake can put them back into nerve cells as they're broken down and reused, or they can be flushed from the system. For example, someone who does stimulant drugs, all of the locks and keys, all the places for uh, normally occurring neuroadrenaline or norepinephrine are filled, it can't be all broken back down. And so some of the naturally occurring neurotransmitters get flushed out of the system. They leave the body in the urine, resulting in a shortage of stimulant uh, enzymes and stimulant neurotransmitters in the future and that crashing tired feeling that people who do stimulants have when they withdraw from the stimulant. It's important to remember that drugs, both prescription drugs and drugs of abuse, change levels of neurotransmitters by a number of mechanisms. 
they can raise the level of neurotransmitters by causing release. They can be an agonist, either a direct one or indirectly. They can act shaped like a neurotransmitter and mimic its action or cause other chemicals to mimic it. Uh, it can act just like the neurotransmitter. They can increase release. They can cause the vesicles at the end of certain cells to start throwing out neurotransmitters, even though there's no uh, signal there that requires it. Things like SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SNRIs, selective norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors, can raise the level of certain neurotransmitters by preventing the enzymes from breaking them down and them being taken back up. Drugs can also lower the level of naturally occurring uh, uh, neurotransmitters. Agonists block receptors and therefore cause the neurotransmitters to be flushed out. Uh, enzymes can be introduced that break down neurotransmitters and there can be either direct or indirect antagonists that reduce the levels of naturally occurring neurotransmitters in the brain. Some other ways that drugs can alter the level of neurotransmitters by interfering with manufacture or transport of neurotransmitters, causing the vesicles to leak and you release chemicals that aren't needed preventing the enzymes from breaking down neurotransmitters and preventing reuptake. For our purposes, the important thing to understand is how drugs work. They impact a naturally occurring process by stimulating or by shutting down a system. They need to be shaped to fit or block a receptor site. They have to be soluble and reach the site of action, primarily by crossing the blood-brain barrier. If a drug does all of those things, it will create the same sensations as naturally occurring neurotransmitters, but generally at a much stronger, higher level. So what are some of the major types of neurotransmitters that a drug and alcohol student should know about? Well, norepinephrine or noradrenaline acts as a stimulant and stimulates nerve cells, and stimulant drugs of abuse mimic this. Acetylcholine relaxes nerve cells, and some depressant drugs mimic this. Endorphins are a naturally occurring chemical which turns off the pain circuit. If they didn't, you could only feel pain once in a particular part of their body, and after that, it, you would always have pain there. Well, the endorphins turn that pain off so those circuits can be reset and you would feel pain the next time you were injured in that place. But endorphin stands for androgynous morphine and it turns out that all morphine opiate family drugs are shaped like endorphins in a general way. Serotonin relaxes, regulates emotion, uh, can affect sleep and mood. It's connected with depression. Uh, low levels of it. And so certain uh, drugs of abuse alter the levels of serotonin. Dopamine is related to perception. Increases in dopamine sh are connected to pleasure. Certain drugs of abuse, for example, cocaine seems to increase the uh, level of dopamine about 400%. Sex only 200%. Methamphetamine increases it 10 times. So you can see that dopamine from natural events might make you feel slightly happy. From drugs, it might make you feel very happy for a short period of time, but when it wears off, then those neurotransmitters, dopamine, no longer are present in the brain, at least not at the levels of before. GABA is a chemical that has to do with inhibition, and glutamate is another neurotransmitter that is connected with learning and memory.
In the early days of neuroscience, a lot of emphasis was placed on the various parts of the brain and learning those parts. And one part may specialize in a particular function, such as the prefrontal cortex specializes in executive function. But we've also learned that the pathways between the various parts of the brain are very important. A neurotransmitter may have differing effects in various parts of the brain. For our purposes in drug counseling, it's probably not a We should also talk in this section about neurogenesis, the ability to grow new neurons. We used to think that once the brain was grown, fully grown, which we now think is about age 24 to 26, people would have all the neurons they would ever have. However, we've learned that new neurons do continue to grow, particularly in the hippocampus, which functions in storing memories. And we learn that stress suppresses the growth of these new neurons. Depressed people typically have a small Some other brain-related issues to talk about while we're on this subject is the story of how much of your brain are you using? Uh, it's often quoted that uh, people are only using a small part, say 10% of their brain. But this turns out to be very misleading. Think about moving from a one-bedroom apartment into a 20-room house and how in that new house uh, you might spread your furniture out. So while you might have a dining room uh, table and four chairs, you would put the dining table in the dining room, but might put one chair in, in the entry uh, hallway and one chair in the parlor and one chair in the library. Similarly, your bedroom furniture, if you went from one bedroom to five or six bedrooms, you might have a bed in one room and put your dresser in another and put your nightstand in a third. In effect, you'd spread your furniture out and make use of all the rooms, but every room would have a lot So, in this chapter, the nervous system, we learned a lot of new terminology. Well, regardless of the textbook you were using and following along in, the chapter on the nervous system would include many of these new terms. We talked about neurons, nerve cells, dendrites, axon, that long part, 
myelin, the insulation, synapses or synaptic gaps, the junctions between nerve cells, receptors, and we talked about how they could increase or decrease, action potential, which is the ability to produce an electron. Some additional terms I hope you're familiar with now. Agonist, which is something that acts the same as a neurotransmitter. Antagonist, something that counteracts a naturally occurring and neurotransmitter. The axon terminals, which are the ends of the nerve cell, and the vesicles, which store the neurotransmitters and then release them. Talked about the blood-brain barrier and how drugs of abuse or therapeutic drugs Students in these classes always ask what they should have learned and what they should be studying for the test. Well, some of the big things you should develop, not just a memorization, but an understanding of are signals and how they move within the brain and the nervous system. That within a cell, it is largely electrical, but between cells, it is chemically moved. And that explains why drugs of abuse can alter signaling within the brain and change the way people think, feel, and behave. We understand. 